Good evening and welcome to tonight's Lockdown Learning Conversation. My name is Bren Carlil and I am the Director of Public Affairs at the Zionist Federation of Australia. It is my pleasure this evening to be talking to Moshe Yalom. Now, before I properly introduce Moshe, I thought I'd take this opportunity to let you know of the other speakers that we have coming up in the next couple of weeks. We will be speaking to Iman Amasha, who is the spokesperson for the Israel Embassy here in Australia. We'll also be speaking with Zeddy Lawrence, who is the editor of the Australian Jewish News, and also Naftali Bennett, who is the head of the New Right, or Tzion Shavar Party. Um, however, that is all in the future, and tonight we are speaking to Moshe. Now, Moshe Yalom has a long history of close involvement with Israel's security. He was first conscripted to the IDF in 1968, called up to fight in the Yom Kippur War as a reservist, and then later enlisted as a professional soldier. From there, he went from strength to strength, becoming head of Sayyid Matkal, the paratroopers and military intelligence, before eventually becoming deputy chief of staff and in turn, chief of staff of the IDF. But he was only getting started. Since entering the Knesset in 2009, he has served as Minister for Strategic Affairs and Minister for Defense. Even now in opposition and head of the Telem party, he is on the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, as well as the Subcommittee for Intelligence. In short, on defense issues, he has earned his stripes and it is my pleasure to talk with him this evening. Moshe, welcome to Lockdown Learning. Good evening, Bren. And good evening to everybody. I'm glad to be with you this evening to share uh, my observations regarding the challenges uh, of the Perfect. Um, now, Moshe, you, let's step back a bit. You, as I said in the introduction, you were called up to fight in the Yom Kippur War as a reservist, but you later enlisted as a professional soldier. What made you go back and join the army professionally? I actually drafted to the military in 1968. It was a year after the Six Day War. And at that time, the feeling in uh, Israel was that it should have been the last war. After such a defeat of the Arabs, it should have been the last war. That's why I didn't think about a long uh, military service. Uh, and I, was, I retired from the military after uh, com accomplishing my uh, uh, mandatory service at the end of 1971 as a sergeant in the uh, paratroopers, uh, the paratroopers battalion, and I became a kibbutz member. And on October 1973, I was mobilized as reservist, serving in the paratroopers uh, brigade, which was the first one to cross the Suez Canal. Uh, as a sergeant, and at that time, because my frustration from the political as well as the senior military leadership, I decided to go back to a professional military service. So, to so be you, thought, actual, you thought you could do better and, than, than those in charge? Yeah, to be, to be commissioned as an officer and to become a platoon leader in a part of his battalion my regular battalion, which lost, unfortunately, a lot of officers, the battalion who absorbed the Syrian uh, offensive in the Golan Heights. Mm. I thought about serving just one year as the platoon leader, but I retired after 37 years of military service in 2005 as the chief of general staff. Well, that's um, what I wanted to do this evening is to, if you like, uh, walk through your CV a little bit. Um, because uh, because your 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 time in the IDF and then as, and then in the Knesset and the various defence roles there have really uh, coincided with some remarkable periods in Israeli history. So I wouldn't mind getting your thoughts on those, and then uh, and then towards the end of our conversation, we'll turn to um, to the current state of Israeli politics. And for anyone listening, please feel free to um, to post any questions either on Facebook or Zoom if you're watching through Zoom, and we can put that to Moshe. So you were head of military intelligence, or Amman, for three years from 1995, which was when the promise of the Oslo peace process really started to turn sour. Now, I understand, I think I've read somewhere that you were initially a supporter of Oslo, but you later changed your mind about the peace process. Was it, was it your time in Amman that, that changed your mind? I served between 92 to 93 as the... Uh, 
division commander of Judea and Samaria, dealing with the Palestinian first, first Intifada, uh, to the end of the Intifada. Mm -hmm. I dealt with uh, terrorists, certain organizations, quite successfully. Then I left the, the division, the area, to serve as a, a armored, armored division commander. And I came back to serve uh, as head of the intelligence and they let Mr. Rabin at the peak of Oslo, mm. at the peak of the peace forces, 95. And I thought when I heard about the Oslo Agreement, uh, September 93, as one who uh, consider and sanctify human lives more than land, that it might be good to settle the conflict, to reach peace and talk tranquility in the region by giving up land. But when I became the head of the intelligence ad alert, Mr. Abin, I realized at that time that I was wrong. Because actually, uh, uh, I found uh, the halls, as it's called, of Oslo, and the main hall still exists, which is the reluctance of Arafat at that time and Abu Mazen today to recognize our right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people. And this is a gap between us and them. They don't think about territorial compromise even based on 67 lines as the end of conflict, finality of claims. They are not ready to recognize their right to exist as a Jewish state. And this is a huge gap. So I became very, very critical to those who supported the territorial concessions at that time. And I supported Late Mr. Rabin, a strategic vision, and I have to quote him talking about the, what he thought to be the end of the Israeli Palestinian conflict. But we were not going to withdraw to 67 lines, mm -hmm. and we are going to impose sovereignty on the settlement in Judea and Samaria. And of course, to keep the Israeli control of the Jordan Valley. And he said on the broadest interpretation of the term Jordan Valley, which is Igala Long Land, Jerusalem should be unified forever to include Givat Zer and Male Adomir. That was Rabin's uh, uh, vision. Unfortunately, after his uh, assassination, I served under late Mr. Perez, later on our president, and I found that uh, Perez didn't insist about those strategic position, this, this strategic position, and I changed my political orientation as one who grew up on, in the Labour Party. I voted the Likud Party in '96. And later on, I served under Mr. Barak and uh, Sharon and this engagement, which I rejected it. And when I retired from the military, it was me very clear, it is my experience, especially of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I'm not going home. I'm not going to business. I'll be ready to serve the country as politician. And then I joined the Likud party officially at the end of 2008 to participate in the elections. And after it, I became vice prime minister and the strategic affairs minister and later on defense minister. So actually, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict brought me to politics. So the, you mentioned, you know, your realization that the Palestinians um, weren't going to um, change their mind regarding the right of Israel to exist as a, as a Jewish state and, and so on. Was that um, was that your impression? Was that was it Palestinian society? Was it Palestinian leadership? I mean, there's obviously um, there's been lots of research done about um, about the incitement um, and that that occurred in the, in the in the official media and so. On. Is your um, do you think it was the do you think it was the leadership pushing society, or do you think society already held had those views and the leadership reflected society? You know, I found asymmetry between the Israeli approach and the Palestinian approach. 
we thought about security in any piece of land within the land of Israel. And they still now educate their kids to have all Palestine. So for them, the, the biggest illegal settlement is Tel Aviv. They consider Jaffa as an Arab city, Arab town. Mm. Tel Aviv, this is a Zionist, Zionist creation, illegal one. They don't distinguish between Bet El in Judea, Samaria, and Tel Aviv. So with this in mind, and actually they proved it, actually since the dawn of Zionism, we haven't found a leadership which was ready to recognize our right to exist as a Jewish state in any boundaries in the land of Israel. Arafat response to Barak proposal in Camp David, talking about July 2000, two months later, he initiated a war, what mm. they call al Aqsa Intifada. Mm. But it's not new. That was the Arab reaction to the United Nations partition plan proposal of November 47. That was the Arab reaction to the British uh, a proposal, the Peel Commission proposal in the 30s. Mm. The Jews were attacked uh, as a response to any partition plan proposal. And talking about Mahmoud Abbas, the current leader, he didn't accept Olmert's proposal after Annapolis, talking about 2008. So, and in, even after the implementation of this engagement plan, Hamas is not ready to, to, peace, to keep peace and tranquility around the Gaza Strip. We withdrew to the last inch from the Gaza Strip. And they attacked Tel Aviv and Ashdod and Zderot. So for me, it's very clear. They are not ready to recognize our right to exist as a Jewish state. That's why they go on with what they call Mukawama, rejecting the Zionist idea and ready to use force, terror, rockets in order to undermine the Jewish state. So, um... So do you think, I mean, I mean, it sounds like that, that you think that un until so Palestinian society really as a whole basically accepts reality that, you know, the Jews aren't going anywhere, that Israel's here to stay, until Palestinian society accepts that reality, there's no chance of a, of a successful Palestinian state, or at least there's no chance of Israeli-Palestinian peace. When I came for the first time to late Mr. Rabin in August 95 at the peak of Oslo saying that I, I have to warn him, strategic early warning. And I said, I don't see any sign for reconciliation with the state of Israel by Arafat or the Palestinians, not talking about Hamas. Mm. I didn't have to use my sophisticated intelligence sources in order to prove it. I just had to put on the table certain examples of Palestinian textbooks, of the Palestinian official educational curricula, or mm. to show a couple of examples of TV programs for the kids. If you educate the kid to hate Israelis as Jews in a very anti-Semitic way, to wear explosive belt at the age of three, three years old kids, what will be the outcome? But at the end, and this is one of our successes, after absorbing 1,500 casualties as a result of terror, al Intifada, and so forth, and after certain, uh, certain uh, uh, engagement from Gaza Strip, rockets, uh, defensive shield operation, and then protective edge operation, and so forth, I believe that at the end, the Palestinians, as well as the Arabs. They realize that there is no chance to, to push us from the land of Israel, and they have to live with us. That's why today, talking about Judea and Samaria, we have, we have reached a certain modus vivendi in which Abu Mazen understands, that first of all, is dependent on us. If you yeah. talk about economy, 200,000 Palestinians are employed by Israelis. 200,000. This, mm -hmm. this is economic generator, not donation. 
זה mm. infrastructure, זה dependent on us by all means, water, uh, energy, and even security. Abu Mazen understand, Mahmoud Abbas, he understand that without the cooperation, security cooperation, and actually, in fact, we do 70% of the job in fighting Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and ISIS in Judea and Samaria. Mm-hmm. We do the most of, part of the job. They do 30%, but the cooperation is very beneficial for them. Otherwise, Abu Mazen would be able to survive, as he didn't survive in the Gaza Strip after the implementation of this engagement plan. Well, see, if, if you so, ask me, this is, the, this is the conundrum, because everything you said, like, I agree with it, and I, and I recognize, I, back in the day, I used to work for Palestinian Media Watch, which is an outfit based in Jerusalem that, that translates Arabic language media into, into, uh, into English for, for journalists and stuff. Um, and, and certainly, I understand the... Um, the, the jobs um, that Palestinians have, uh, both in the settlements and, and in sovereign Israel, as well as the security cooperation, I get all of that. What I don't understand is if a bus, in, not so much Arafat, but if a bus in particular realizes that the Palestinian Authority's ongoing existence is dependent on Israel, at the sa- and, and surely those 200,000 Palestinians, who might not necessarily like Israelis, but realize they have jobs with Israelis, and so they're their livelihood is dependent on Israel to a certain extent. Why do they have that in one hand and in the other hand still hold on, realistically hold on, well, not realistically, but, but, but in, in their heart, hold on to this dream of one day destroying Israel? I don't, I don't get that, that conundrum, how, how they realize that Israel's not going anywhere, but at the same time hold on this mukalma, this idea that one day they'll get rid of Israel. I mean, it doesn't make sense that it's such a contrast. Um, yeah. Anyway. Sure. There's, there, there is a contrast. But you know, the narrative, the raison d'etre is fighting Israel. Actually, there was a unified power talking about the Arabs around us. But the good news is that the Arabs has realized that there is no chance to defeat Israel. That's why King Hussein of Jordan, 1970, realized that he has a strategic ally in the region, he's not Arab, he's Jewish. Mm-hmm. Since summer 1970, we enjoy strategically, I was a young paratrooper in 1970, ready to go with my unit, ready to go into Jordan to save King Hussein because of Israel. Since then, 24 years, without any peace accord, without any uh, document written by lawyers, we enjoyed strategic relations with King Hussein of Jordan. Later on, with Sadat, with, with Egypt, 1977, there's a visit to Israel, 1979, the peace accord was signed. And today, we enjoy, let's say, good relationship with many Sunni Arab regimes, realizing, first of all, that there is no way to defeat Israel. Secondly, we, we have to, to get to, now, we are on the same side fighting Iran, ISIS, Muslim Brotherhood elements, all over. So we share at least three common enemies, but it's not just that. They understand that Israel can support them. When it comes to uh, energy today, the oil is irrelevant as a strategic asset, and they understand that they have to go to high tech. Of course, if there's a shortage of water in the region, they understand that we have the technologies, the salination, recycling water for agriculture, agriculture in the desert. We are very ex- ex- we are mm. experts on it, so they have, have a lot to benefit. That's why I claim that we shouldn't be in a hurry when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When we talk today about the situation, the Palestinians who live in Judea and Samaria enjoy the most, the best (laughs) economic situation rather than the entire in the region because they are connected with us. So let's wait and see what will come out of it. But 
forget about final settlement. When it comes to final settlement, the narrative is Israel should be annihilated. Let's do it, I call it from the bottom up. Well, you sound like um, quite a, a disciple of Jabotinsky in, the, uh, in convincing um, Israel's various adversaries that, that there's no chance of, of destroying Israel. But it sort of uh, make me turn to the second intifada. I mean, you were, I mean, you, you won the intifada in your positions in, in, in central command and then later as, um, as, as chief of staff. But I mean, um, the, the security cooperation with Israel has been, uh, has been in place um, since uh, since Abbas was, was 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 in power, ever since Arafat died, um, but it feels like those the, the Palestinians today coming of age uh, don't remember the Intifada, you know, because the Second Intifada was obviously pretty rough for Palestinians back in two thousand and two, two thousand and three. Um, is there a chance that that the lessons of that Intifada have been forgotten, and that and that the youth today will once again wants to um, turn to violence in order to achieve their objectives? I believe that Abu Mazen is, look, is not looking for violence. He learned the lesson. And the lesson was, and I insisted on it from the very beginning, terror, violence shouldn't pay off. And that was the strategic goal not to allow them any benefit, any achievement by using violence. And we did it successfully. We were ready to the second intifada. It, it took time. Mm. It was quite devastating, you know, to absorb homicide bombing attacks again and again and again. But at the end, we reached the goal. And my lesson is the best defense is a good offense. When we move from the defense to the offense in defensive shield operation, invading into areas H, A, which we were, we were, not, were restricted not to operate there because of the Oslo agreement, and we reached it, eliminating the terror infrastructure, mainly the terrorists, the, 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 the uh, ammunition, the weapons, but mainly the terrorists step by step. Mm. And it took us about two years, from 2002 to 2004, and then we reached the current situation in which we use the freedom of operation using intelligence dominance, which is very important, to know that someone is preparing or planning a terror attack in Jenin, inside Jenin, and then to send, to deploy a special force or whatever to arrest the terrorists in advance. In most of the cases, because of our intelligence dominance, uh, we are successful. Not, not 100%, but 99% successful. But you know, the... so, there are many lessons to learn. It might be that the new generation, we are talking about youngsters that didn't experience it, might mm -hmm. change their mind. But that's why we have to keep this deterrence, this ongoing operation. We haven't stopped the, the, the offensive since 2002. Every night, our troops are deployed to arrest terrorists. That's why we enjoy relatively calm situation today. It's not because of lack of motivation on the side, but because of our policy, strategy, and operational skills. Well, you know, that leads me to my next question, because the, the violent tactics that Palestinians have used in the territories has, has evolved over time. There's, you know, if you think of the Intifada, which, you know, slingshots and the burning tires, and, and then the second Intifada, which, which a lot of it was suicide bombs and so on. Um, and now Israel um, prevented many of those, both with the, the kinetic operations that you were discussing, defensive shield, but also the security barrier that Israel put in place from 2003. You know, then, then we got uh, more and more rockets. Obviously, after disengagement, the rockets increased. Israel has managed to stop many of the rockets with its own counter deployment. So now we're getting the, you know, the, the balloons with the, with, the petri with the fire on them and then the tunnels. Like, what, what will the next bit of violence look like? I mean, I'm sure you guys have got, um, 
you know, rooms full of people thinking up ways that Palestinians might want to uh, enact violence. Like, is there any idea of what the sort of next outbreak would look like? We should be ready to any wave of violence, but I believe that uh, by using this strategy, the combined one, in which in one hand we use a big stick against the terrorists, till now, on a daily basis. On the other hand, we allow the entire population to live in dignity, to enjoy well-being, actually by being employed by Israelis. About 100,000 are employed by Israelis in Israel. About 40,000 are employed in the settlements in Judea and Samaria. Many are employed as subcontractors of Israeli industry. Our textile industry is manufactured today either in China until the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic and the entire in, 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 in Judea and Samaria by the Palestinians. Now we have more, more to, to, to work for them as an example because of the, of the virus. Nevertheless, uh, by allowing them to live in, in, in dignity and to enjoy well-being, we don't push them to the corner when it comes to, to terror. It's very difficult to mobilize them for another wave of violence. But it might be, you know, some uh, incitement using uh, whatever, Temple Mount, religious motifs, might uh, uh, mobilize people to, to attack Jews. It might be. We should be. We should be ready. But you know, when it comes to security, we have to look around us. Iran is the main generator and instigator of instability, instability in the region. And it is not just the nuclear project, which should be stopped by, by, by one way or another, or another. The Iranian in, intervention in Syria by trying to, to, to create a threatening deployment against us. Lebanon vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah, Yemen with the Houthis, although it is far away, they are looking for any chance to, to attack us. Supporting Hamas and the Islamic Jihad by money, by know-how, how to produce, how to manufacture uh, rockets, uh, unmanned air vehicles, and so forth. So generally speaking, Iran is the focal point when it comes to the threats around us. And then we have to be ready to be engaged with Hezbollah from Lebanon, Shia militias from, from Syria, and Hamas by Islam Jihad from Gaza Strip by rockets or terror attacks in, from the Judea and Samaria. Well, and we are ready. Let's turn to Iran then. What, what will stop Iran? Uh, I strongly support the idea to press the regime. Yes, the Iranian regime is a apocalyptic one, radical one, but at the end of the day, when it comes to its survivability, they become very pragmatic. This is my experience. Mm -hmm. And looking back, to what has happened with, this, with the current leader, Khamenei, is, uh, is in his position for a very, very long period of time. And when we look to 2003, after the United States moved from the defense to the offense, first phase was in Afghanistan, the second one was in Iraq. The main question among rogue leaders in the region was who might be targeted next in the third phase of the U.S. offensive. Mm -hmm. At that time in history, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya decided to give up his military nuclear project without a single shot. Mm -hmm. And Khamenei suspended the military project. I was at that time as the chief of general staff. I followed the Iranian project since the 90s, serving as head of the intelligence. He suspended all the activities on the nuclear project in 2003. He renewed it in 2005 when he realized that the United States, the US administration at that time, lost its political stomach to go to another phase. Mm -hmm. 
That was one experience. In 2012, I was a minister, and a combination of political isolation of the Iranian regime, crippling economic sanctions, which brought the Iranian economy to be in shambles, a credible military option. They were afraid that Israel or United States will operate against them because of the nuclear project at the time. And because of these three elements, they were afraid from internal uprising. That's what brought Khamenei to the table to be engaged with the great Satan, America. He had to explain it. He called it a flexible heroism. Uh, so I believe that even now, when we talk about the current situation, a combination of political isolation, which doesn't exist so far, because of the Europeans are not ready to isolate the regime so far, crippling economic sanctions, which exist because of the US policy, the sanctions, credible military option, might be, not yet, and the fear from internal uprising, uprising still exists. So a combination of these four elements, I believe, will bring again the regime to dilemma, whether to go on with the rogue activities, not just about the nuclear project, by proliferation of arms and terror, and supporting certain rogue elements in the region, and, 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 and to this dilemma, whether to go on with it or to survive the regime, when it comes to this junction, I'm sure the choice will be survivability. But we've it seen, is a point ahead of us. But we've seen, um, particularly during the Syrian war, when, um, despite the fact the Iranian economy is tanking, Iran has still been sending military aid and still been sending fighters to, to Syria. I mean, so they, they still seem to be putting, I mean, sure, they, they put their foreign policy ahead of their own people. I mean, that's to be expected. But, but even, when, even when their back's against the wall, they still seem to be pursuing this, this idea of exporting the revolution. Uh, um, but, I, but I think you're right. The... Um, you know, like a shark, at their weakest, uh, you know, their underbelly is is, is their, their own people, and and, and if, if 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 their own if their own regime could be a threat, not so much from you know external warfare, but but their people rising up, then um, you know we've seen that we've seen them come close a few times, but I guess the um, you know the uh, I don't it's the the people the Iranian people it's it's like you know. A lot of them, you know, maybe half of them hate the regime, but uh, the, there is still so much loyalty to the revolution in the population. I mean, how do you turn that? Is it just time? It's very, it's very interesting question. You know, I, I asked this uh, question since the 90s because many claims that, uh, many experts claim that the vast majority of Iranians, they don't like the mullahs. They are moderates, they are not radicals, and they don't want to sacrifice for whatever, Hezbollah in Lebanon, for Assad in Syria, for the Houthis in Yemen, they are not, or for the Palestinians. But having said that, the regime has succeeded in strengthening its grip in governing, governing by suppression, suppressing the people, the dissidents, by oppression, by executing dissidents, you know, almost on a daily basis, by creating in the marketplace. So there is no leadership, opposition to confront the regime. And when it appeared, and it was demonstrated in 2009 by the Green Revolution, the two leaders of the revolution at that time who came from within the regime, mm. Musawi and Karuvi, they are still under arrest, till now. But you know, there is a lot of developments now. First of all, the coronavirus. The official numbers of casualties as a result of the coronavirus in Iran, about uh, 8,000 who did, died from, in, from the virus. Mm -hmm. The numbers that I know is 25,000. 
And people now are afraid to go to the streets to demonstrate because of the virus. Yeah, yeah. But last November, many of them went to the streets, mm. demonstrating because of the economic situation. So let's wait and see what will come out. People are not happy in Iran. They are very critical to the regime. So let's wait and see what will come out after the pandemic. Can I move to Iraq? Um, arguably, the, the, strategic, the main strategic battle happening in the Middle East at the moment is over control of Iraq and whose sphere of influence Iraq will remain in. Uh, who's, who's winning that particular battle, do you think? Yeah, the conflict, generally speaking, in, in the region, the main conflict is not about Israel. It's neither the Israeli-Arab conflict, which doesn't exist, nor the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which exists. It's about, it's about Sunni Shia, it's about uh, Arabs and Iranians, Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, ISIS. Israel is not engaged. Now, when we talk about Iraq, the main struggle is about hegemony in Iraq, between Iran in one hand and the United States on the other hand. And I believe that uh, the assassination of Soleimani gave an advantage to the United States. You know, until the assassination of Soleimani, Qasem Soleimani was a commander of Al-Quds force of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, and he was quite capable. We, we saw him everywhere, in Lebanon, by instructing Hezbollah, in Syria, advising to Assad, and the uh, deploying Shia militias over there to support the regime in Yemen and in Iraq. He was assassinated by the United States in Iraq after an attack on an uh, American target. And it was uh, for the first time after quite an absorption of attacks by the Americans that they responded. And it changed the situation. I believe that the Iranian regime is deterred is weaker now because of, uh, the, of the assassination. Slimani mm -hmm. was very capable. The, there is no re replacement for him so far. So nowadays, the internal struggle in Iraq between those who are associated with the United States and those who are associated and supported by Iran, I believe that nowadays the United States enjoys the upper hand. Good. <laughs> Long may it last. Inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. Um, look, I, turning, turning back to the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, and I do want to talk about the annexation issue soon, but before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about the International Criminal Court. Now, um, I have a little theory, and that is um, from, from 2014, Palestinians have refused to negotiate with Israel. And in my mind, it's because they've realised that because they have no political capital in their own society because the Palestinian Authority is detested because of, you know, everything, um, that they basically realised they can't negotiate anymore because they can't make the compromises that they would need to make because they can't sell it to their own people because they've been pushing this maximalist idea of full right of return and end of Israel and so on and so forth. So for that reason, they've um, they've turned to the international route. They went to the UN to upgrade their status. They joined the International Criminal Court. And it feels like that tactic, particularly that the International Criminal Court has really started to become very successful. Um, I am quite concerned about the preliminary investigation the ICC currently has, and it feels like they'll turn it into a proper investigation soon. Do you, do you think it's as dangerous or worrying as, as I think it is? The ICC is called the International Criminal Court, but it is a political court. Yes. And we are happy that the United States is pushing now the ICC, especially uh, the prosecutor Ben Suda, which is by she is biased to the Palestinian side. So we should worry about it, but you know. I uh, personally avoided going to London for certain years because there was a, a restaurant against us. Mm. As I was ready to sacrifice my life in the battlefield, I said, 
So I'll give up London for a couple of years. Although I was graduated in the British Staff College, but because of this arrest warrant, I avoided going to, to London. This is the case with the ICC. We should fight in this arena because, first of all, uh, it is a biased uh, court. And when it comes now to the annexation, I would say, first of all, it's a wrong term, annexation. You can't annex something which, is belong, which belongs to you. And that's one of the uh, important elements in the Trump plan, recognizing Israel's right to live and to settle everywhere in the land of Israel. We have to make our mind. I don't want to have my national state, that I don't claim that we, we should ignore the existence of the Palestinian leadership, I actually enjoy political independence, and I, I, I'm happy for it. I don't want them to vote to the Knesset or to be second-class uh, uh, citizens in Israel. That's fine. So, but they have the, already the political independence, they have their own parliament, they have their own government, they have their own rais, whatever, president, whatever. I'm happy with it. But on the other hand, forget about final settlement. So in between, avoiding having a binational in one hand. On the other hand, realizing there is no chance for final settlement to the horizon. I claim we have to make progress from the bottom up, not by slogans like annexation or whatever. Or we have to, to do it as we did it till now. From defensive shield operation till now, we enhanced our interest. The connection between us and the Palestinians are, is like Siamese twins. Mainly they are dependent on us, as I mentioned. Economy, infrastructure, security. So let's make progress step by step according to Rabin's vision, which I mentioned earlier. And the Trump plan is actually, in a way, very close to Rabin's vision to exclude swaps. Rabin did, wasn't ready to, to negotiate certain territories within the 67 lines on the Israeli side. It appears uh, on the Trump plan, this is my reservation. Nevertheless, it's not going to be implemented now, neither on the 1st of July, nor to the end of uh, Trump is President Trump tell him? I'm not sure what will be the, 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 is, is, is the end of his term now or after another other four years. I don't know. Nevertheless, we should make progress from the bottom up and we shouldn't be in a hurry. And we should look at the ICC as one of the weapons used against us. And we have to fight back. Could I just clarify what you just said? You said it's not going to be implemented now, such as 1st of July or by the end of Trump's plan. Were you talking about Trump's vision for peace or were you talking about the application of Israeli sovereignty to parts of the West Bank? The Trump vision, we have to embrace it with reservations, as I said. First of all, it changed the narrative. It changed the, the paradigm. Now, as defense minister, I have many disputes with uh, Secretary Kerry, who came into the region at the end of 2013, saying, I'm going to conclude the conflict within nine months. I became quite blatant. And I, said, I, I told him, we have many, many meetings. I said, Mr. Secretary, you remind me, a guy who is going the third time to the same movie, and they're looking for another end, happy end. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And it didn't happen. And I found better understanding in Washington today. Mm. And it appeared on the Trump plan. First of all, we have the right. We came to the land of Israel after 2,000 years in exile. Because it is our land. There was the Palestinian state. state Jerusalem wasn't the capital for any other state. You know, my, my grandparents, who unfortunately perished in the Holocaust in 1942, tried again and again and again, next year, in Jerusalem. 
my optimism actually from, based on the fact that I'm sure that in 1942 they didn't think they drank they, dra they drank but they didn't think about having a Jewish independent state within six years mm. this is a source of inspiration for me mm. I know I'm sure that they didn't dream that their grand grandson will be able to serve the, the Jewish state as independent state, state of Israel. But nevertheless, there is better understanding in Washington to what is the conflict is all about. It's not about settlements. It is not about 67 line. It's about our very existence, our right to exist as a Jewish state. In this regard, we have to embrace the concept and we have to keep our reservations regarding the swap, which I strongly uh, reject. So, what I mean, what's the end outcome? I mean, you talked about, um, I mean, something short of a state, but I mean, Palestinians want a state. And I don't think that, I mean, they're a highly nationalist society. I don't think that they're ever going to be satisfied. I mean, look at, look at 1987. Um, you know, in the 20 years from 1967, Israel dramatically improved the Palestinian standard of living, put in roads and sewage and electricity and running water and all sorts of things, universities, and it was, it was very good. And yet in 1987, the Palestinians rose because ultimately they didn't want to be occupied. And, you know, like, what's, what's the end state? Do you envision at some, at some point there being a Palestinian state or is the status quo sustainable? The end states, which I believe in, which Yitzhak Rabin believed in, Igal Alon believed in, and it comes even in the Trump plan, an autonomy. Anyhow, according to Oslo, according to the Trump plan, the Palestinian political entity should be demilitarized. And we have Israel the overall responsibility for security. I don't see any other option. That's one element. The second, and, and Rabin called it a, a Palestinian entity which is less than a state. The second element which is very important, that Israel should control the, all the passages to this piece of land to the state of Israel, to the Palestinian entity. Otherwise, we will be challenged by Iranians, will be challenged by ISIS, will be challenged by Palestinian refugees coming back to the area, which is not going to settle the conflict. It's going to exaggerate it. Thirdly, I mentioned it. The Palestinians are dependent on our economy. Their official currency, is a shekel, not incidentally. The real economy, Palestinian economy, is based on our economy. Not talking about the water supply, electricity, gas, and as I mentioned, security. So we will have at the end of the process, the end game, a Palestinian autonomy, which will be connected to Israel like a Siamese twin. I don't see any other option. And on July 1, is, do you think Netanyahu will present to cabinet a, uh, a plan to, to apply sovereignty to parts of the West Bank? Do you think it's going to happen? I, you know, I was interviewed this morning about this issue here. And I said that yeah, all the uh, discussion, political discussion now, political discourse in Israel regarding the uh, options, it is called annexation, unfortunately. Uh, I claim this is the wrong term. Uh, is is a, a very political one. Unfortunately, we are now in Israel are engaged in, in a political crisis, leadership crisis. You know that uh, 
Prime Minister Netanyahu has been indicted and he has been brought to the court because of corruption and, uh, you know, whatever, uh, bribery, uh, fraud, uh, trust. And uh, those, this political discourse, in a way, is used to divert the discussion from these real problems. Uh, I believe that uh, we are paying a price for it. I prefer not to discuss the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I, I believe that the Arabs around us are careless about the Palestinians. So why to raise this issue? Why to bring it to the uh, international political arena to draw in Europeans criticizing it? So I claim that uh, the, the, the uh, right way is to make progress step by step and not to push us now to discuss the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, annexation, whatever. It doesn't serve our interest. You know, I published a book. It was translated actually uh, to English and then uh, it was published before the Corona virus pandemic on January, which is called The Longer, Shorter Path. Mm. I believe that there are no shortcuts. Those who believed in peace now uh, came wrong, proved to, to, be, to be wrong. And those who believe now by full annexation of Judea and Samaria, forget about it. Both sides, I claim, messianic, are not pragmatic, are not uh, are avoiding the fact on the ground. And I believe in, in a long way, which is a short one, a longer, shorter path. And this is the way that we have to deal with the Trump plan as well, to make progress according to the plan as a vision, but not to implement everything now. You know, every time I um, do a shortcut or try and cut corners here at home, my wife tells me the short way is the long way. So I feel I should buy her a copy of, of your book and uh, she can uh, rub it in my face. Do you, do you think, um, Benny Gantz will become Prime Minister in 18 months' time. Do you think that agreement will hold? No. You know, I, talking about Israeli politics, I resigned from the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu as a Defence Minister on May 2016, and we didn't have disputes about strategic issues. Not about Iran, not about Hezbollah, not about the Palestinians. We agreed. And, you know, seven years serving in, his, in, in government, I feel like it was very beneficial. Very good discussions, looking to the challenges around us, external challenges, eye by eye. I was very satisfied. But unfortunately, things that happened, especially internally, which brought me to a point which I had to resign, corruption, uh, political discourse based on hatred, not just Jews versus Arabs, which I don't tolerate. Jews, rightists, leftists, uh, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, religious, non-religious, we should be unified in Israel. This is one of our national security strengths, to be unified, ready to fight together, to operate together. And I did like it, the way of separating, uh, inciting against each other. And then some other element that I was very critical about the way that we manage the country or mismanagement of the country, nevertheless, after my resignation, I put it very, very clear. I insist to go back to the national leadership, but we should unify forces. That was blue and white. Benny Gantz appeared to be uh, more elected than put, put his way. So he was the first to lead blue and white. And our goal was to change the course of the country. And within two months, we created Blue and White on February last year. On April, the first elections, 
he became an alternative. Then we won the elections of the second round. And even on the third round, more voters were against Netanyahu than those who supported him. But unfortunately, this is my criticism to Benny Gantz, in the last minute, he decided to join Netanyahu. And you can see certain very negative phenomena now in our country. The offensive against the, the court, the judicial system, the attorney general, the uh, police. Uh, this is not the way to keep Israel as Jewish and democratic. Democracy is not just election. We know it. It's about checks and balances, the separation between the authorities, the government, the, the parliament, the judicial system, and so forth. Uh, last week, uh, one of our journalists was threatened to be brought to the court. We are not Turkey. And unfortunately, Benny Gant, in a demonstrating weakness, decided to join the government. And I decided to be in the opposition. And now the challenge is to create another alternative. We should create another alternative in order to change the course of the country. And as you understand, the disputes are not about external challenges. They are about internal challenges which have become more important today for the future of our country. Look, I, I've only ever been to Israel as a visitor. I, I lived there for a couple of years on the kibbutz and in Jerusalem. But again, I was always, I was always an outsider. And, and, and what I noticed is that Israeli society has always been at each other's throats. It, it, unless there is a, you know, when, when the Second Intifada started, there was unity. Yeah, there was unity. There was, there was um, uh, a, a deep threat from the outside. Well, there was a threat from the outside and, uh, and people united. But when, when there is no active threat, um, Israeli society is at each other's throats. And so it seems to be all bizarre. Do you think it's worse now? Because it, 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 to me, it appears, you know, <laughs> normal. I claim that when the Israelis feel the knife, the neck, they are unified. Mm. But is, now it is under risk. Because if you base your political power on incitement, and that's what it is done now, whether it is uh, rightist and leftist, leftists are traitors. I commanded leftists in the, in the military. Jews versus Arabs. I commanded Arabs in the military. Uh, Ashkenazi, Sephardi. Religious, non religious. I didn't uh, look at under the helmet of, of, of a fighter whether he have a keeper, a Yamulka or not. I care less about it. Now, that's why I'm so, so aware and, and worried about this kind of incitement. I visited, I paid condolences visit to Israeli Arab families who lost their sons falling in action, fighting Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Bedouins, Muslims, Christians, Druze. So I claim that for our, a better future for the country, any leader of the country, any leadership of the country, shouldn't base its political power by generating hatred and inciting against each other. It's a very important element in our, in our national security. And we should overcome this kind of cri leadership crisis that we are engaged in now. I'm sure, knowing very well, the Israelis at the end we will overcome it. You know, I know our strengths and weaknesses. And our main strength, I claim, is our spirit, our hearts, and our knowledge, our minds. This is a, this, our well-known secret for having a very strong military might, 
based on quality, not on quantity. That's why we are not short of water anymore, because we went to desalination, recycling water. That's why we have a strong economy, because of high tech, sophisticated agriculture in the desert. So I believe that we have so many strong elements, positive elements within the Israel society, but nowadays, leadership crisis, which I'm sure that we will overcome. Look, uh, on that note, I'm going to um, say thank you and, uh, and say good night to our audience. Moshe, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us this evening. It has been a real pleasure speaking to you, to hearing your thoughts on not just the current realities, but the really what's been happening over the last 20, 30 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for support to our state, the state of Israel. It is our pleasure. We're all, we're all looking forward to, to getting back there once the, uh, once the airlines open again. So good night, everybody.